20,000 for a rebuild, plus the 20,000 for rent and for storage. And Gardaí are appealing for witnesses to violent disorder in Dublin before last Sunday's FAI Cup final at the Aviva Stadium to come forward. They say a number of people were assaulted and cars were damaged outside a premises in Irish Town shortly before three o'clock. Videos and photos of the brawl were widely shared on social media and Gardaí are asking one, anyone who recorded footage to come forward. They're also appealing to any drivers with dash cam footage or who were on Irish Town Road on a Sunday afternoon to contact them. No arrests have yet been made. It's two and a half minutes past seven. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. This Christmas, give the gift of travel with a Ryanair gift card. Cold and mostly dry tonight with some sleet possible on higher ground. Frost developing, especially in the east of the country where it will be coldest. Patchy mist and hill fog forming with lowest temperatures of zero to plus four degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Run on Off The Ball with Gillette. Proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, start your razors. This is News Talk. You're very welcome along. Six Premier League games this evening on the show. The top three all in action this evening, including a Merseyside derby. Mark Lawrence will be with us around half past seven or so. After eight o'clock, Keith Wood and Jerry Thornley coming your way on Wednesday Night Rugby. We have Robert Pires in the show. He was part of a recent road show. He's going to pick his dream five-a-side team from former teammates. And then Matt Slater will join us at 9 o'clock. Matt Slater, brilliant journalist. He's been writing about David Beckham and his rather cosy and, let's be honest, very lucrative relationship with Qatar and the Qatar World Cup. Dan McDonnell will be along for the football show as well. 53106 is the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Richie McCormick, hello to you. Yo, how are you? Very well, and Will O'Callaghan, good evening. Evening, Joe, evening, Richie. David Beckham does have a very cosy and lucrative relationship with Qatar, Will. Brand Beckham, for a man who's so brand conscious, I would have thought he might have looked at this one and said, Ugh, not sure this is worth it, but then maybe 150 million does make it worth it. Yeah, football clubs in Miami don't buy themselves and finance themselves along the way, Joe, and... I remember this has kind of been earmarked for a while that there was the you know speculation about the fact that David Beckham may well be getting involved as a brand ambassador. And I noticed that this week as well, uh, Qatar have been flying out journalists and fan groups uh, to an event that's taken place. There's a lot of soft selling ahead of Qatar 2022. And I wonder how much the criticism of the regime is likely to ramp up over the next year or so as we get closer and closer uh, to this World Cup, uh, particularly when people realise how messy the start of the Premier League season is going to be next year, where they try and fit in 18 rounds of fixtures before there's one week off before the World Cup starts and the players assuming England and some of the other countries who supply a lot of the Premier League players will go deep into the competition, they may well have about nine days after the World Cup finishes to be back into league action uh, to ensure that everything gets finished in time for the end of the August to May season. And then that's before we even look at the human rights abuses and uh, what's happened around migrant workers who've passed away getting ready for this World Cup next winter. Yeah, there was something very striking about the image of Lewis Hamilton with the rainbow colours on his helmet high-fiving David Beckham after the Grand Prix. David Beckham there uh, hanging out with all the... uh powers that be in Qatar. 150 million over 10 years is the reported deal to be an ambassador. People have raised the contradictions with his UNICEF work, amongst other things. His people have responded, David has been visiting Qatar for over a decade, played for PSG, so he's seen the passion for football in the country, the long-term commitment that's been made to hosting the World Cup to deliver a lasting legacy. And he's always talked about the power of football as a force for good on many levels. I do wonder, Richie, if David Beckham has ever talked about the power of football as a force for good on many levels, but there we are. He might have done, but I don't think he would have uh, pre-read the words before he read them out in the speech before it was handed to him. Um, it's a strange situation. and it, you, you do wonder what the end game of all of this is for a country like Qatar, because like it's all it's all feeding something like them, them hosting a world cup is obviously you know raising the the nations or the gulf states uh, brand on the on the world stage but like to what end and this has been ongoing for a while ever since they started buying in athletes uh, to compete in the olympic games and world championships and that's extended now to buying the world cup which is you know not a stretch to say that they did and then yeah, to, to, to bring in these uh, Western celebrities and, uh, you know, big names to soft sell a pretty ugly, you know, prospect of a, of a Winter World Cup offset by the death of migrant workers uh, by the dozen. 
Um, it just it does nobody any favors. Like it does it does Beckham's brand no favors. And if money is his ultimate aim, then you know it's, it's as well to just say it. And, and I think people would have a lot more respect for him if you just took the crusty the clown route and said they drove a dump truck full of money up to my house and not made a stone. Um, like because otherwise, you know, this talk of being part of the football family and it having a power force for good is just it's empty fluff. Like there's there's nothing to it at all. Um, him being a brand ambassador for for something like Qatar just nakedly for cash is, is just what it is it's just for money it's one of those things that's an absolute nonsense as well lads that you hear and Formula 1 have been using this a bit around their end of season with the golf as well and the fact that they're you know, going to Saudi Arabia this week and that their first ever Grand Prix in Qatar uh, the week just gone by and it's going to be a 10 year series and the idea is that they're going to come in as a sport that commands respect and they'll actually foster change within these regimes by just coming along like there's absolutely no way that's going to happen they're only being attached by the regimes in order to become, you know, effectively, like you can call it sports washing on the very hard end, or you could say at the very least, it's a very soft sell of what the regime is trying to make itself look like to the outside world. They're being used as opposed to the regime being used by the companies that are going in. Yeah. Like it's a very difficult uh position for lots of sports people in different ways, like when the European tour pitched up in Saudi Arabia. Like there's only so high horse you can get on. I don't have a massive problem or I wouldn't condemn a struggling tour player who is trying to keep his card and wants to support his family and who could really do or benefit from playing in the Saudi Arabian Open. You know, I think I think you really got to ask yourself, well, if I, you know, my, if I was in that position, what would I do? And I think a lot of people would go and play if they're being honest or if they were offered a life changing sum of money. If I asked, well, if I said you're the man to host the Qatar 2022 World Cup podcast for the next uh, two to three years and we're going to pay you half a million a year to uh, move out to Qatar and do so, I wouldn't hold it against you if you said you were going to do that necessarily. Uh, so however, take a pay cut from OTB in order to do so, Joe. But, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, but, fairness, but, I don't, but I don't really but mind I just if finished the point. about it, Joe. Yeah, I just, finished, I just finished the point, sorry. Uh, so I, I think, you know, everything is relative. But when it's David Beckham, who is worth hundreds of millions anyway, and who I, I, whose earning power I think is secure for the next couple of decades, for him to do it... I think is uh, more questions should be asked realistically. That's where that's that'll be my sense. It'll be interesting to see what Matt Slater says later on. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was just going to say, look, if as long as someone isn't talking out of both sides of their mouth, I think it's perfectly okay if you decide as a sports person, you know, the elite level of my sport is going to go through these regimes and perhaps other things that maybe I find morally questionable. But in my mind, it's perfectly okay to compete, and I'm doing this because it's a sport that I'm involved in. That's fine. But don't go to these places and actually be poster boys or poster women for the regime and then turn around and complain about uh, some of the human rights concerns about there or concerns that you might have about the regimes, which are, you know, effectively going to advertise when you compete there. Because that's what sport is. I mean, it's a very easy way to buy great publicity. And this is the same quandary you'd have if you're a Newcastle fan. Like, I don't begrudge any Newcastle fan who wants their club to do well. But if you had concerns about the Saudi regime, it would be a horrible position to be in where you may well have to decide between your love for your club or the morals that you hold dear. Yeah. Uh, one of the great classics was Paul Casey, the golfer, who said, if I played in the Saudi Arabian Open, you can call me a hypocrite. And he played the next year. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the great, one of the great press conferences when he turned up that year, I can tell you. So uh, let's start the news round. It is brought to you by Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Richie, you're starting with... Munster. So good news for, well, 34 at least. Yeah, the great escape uh, was undergone last night in Munster City. 34 individuals who travelled back from South Africa have returned safely to Ireland. Those players and staff must now isolate for 10 days in line with the latest travel restrictions here. 14 members of their party remain in isolation in Cape Town after testing positive for COVID. Munster Academy coach Ian Costello is overseeing preparations of a scratch squad for their December 15th date with Wasps in the Heineken Champions Cup. It seems uh, like all in the are ongoing. That game will go ahead. Munster say they're in regular talks with the EPCR, but judging by Cardiff's missive today, they're not getting out of South Africa tomorrow and they say they must fulfil. Uh, they were their words in their statements, their games with Toulouse and Harlequins. So it looks like no reprieve for those four teams getting back from South Africa. Yeah, it does seem EPCR will are absolutely intent on these games going ahead or I 
presume the option is open to forfeit them for the teams and we'll see those terrible 28-0 scorelines again. But the EPCR don't seem to have weekends available them to them to move games. So it's just a really, really tough answer for Munster and Cardiff and those teams. Yeah, look, it's exactly that. The situation was made slightly more complex this year as well because the start of the tournament was pushed back into December. You know, Traditionally, you'd have a couple of rounds of games coming into the Autumn Internationals. It's a later start. It is a shorter pool stage this year, but the wiggle room isn't there because these games run almost directly at the end of the pool stages into the Six Nations, and then they come out the far side of the Six Nations into knockout competition, and free weekends just aren't there. Like The last thing people probably want to see is for walkovers to be awarded. But I was even looking at um, some of the newspapers this morning who were uh, coming up with the monster selection that could be there from academy players who didn't travel to South Africa that'll be able to train over the next couple of weeks. That may well be what it comes down to for at least the first fixture, maybe even the second fixture yeah. for them in the pool stages. It's just a very unfortunate situation for the Welsh teams and Munster who travelled to South Africa for what they believed was going to be a block of a couple of games and now they're coming back into this absolute mess ahead of such a key part of their season. Yeah, Rory O'Connor took a stab at what the team might be if the South African contingent don't play and to be fair, there are lots of big names available. Andrew Conway, Keith Earls, Damien Diolande, Joey Carberry, Conor Murray, Dave Kilcoyne, Tyke Byrne, Peter Romani could all absolutely and will all, you suspect, play on Sunday the 12th away to Wasps. But th- you're then looking at debutante at full back, a debutante on the wing, debutante at eight, a second appearance from Keane Hurley at number six, a debutante in the second row and two debutantes in the front row. So that will be a serious ask away from home. Now, who knows, by the way, I don't fully know the nature of the quarantining. So Munster are back now in the country. Mm. They can start the clock on their quarantining. Therefore, it would be up on Saturday night. Would it be beyond the bounds that a cohort fly out Sunday morning and say, put me in coach? Might not be. Might not be. I don't, and I don't know what the, because they were making a play for the quarantine to take place in a bubble. So essentially that these 34 individuals or the players at least anyway, would be quarantined together, which would allow them to train together, which would put them very much in contention to to start against uh, Wasps on December 15th. So, you know, it's not beyond the realm's possibility that they do actually put out a pretty strong side yeah. uh, at the Rico. But uh, they, I, we need we need clarity on whether or not those players are within a self-contained bubble or not, or whether they have to split up now for the next uh, week, week and a half, because that will definitely make all the difference to what kind of side uh, Ian Costello is able to put out, or mm. Johan van Graan, if he's, uh, if he's available. Yeah. So, Premier League, Richie, what do we have? Top three all in action tonight. Joseph leaders Chelsea have made the trip to Vicarage Road to face their former manager, Claudio Ranieri, and Watford. Chelsea making six changes uh, for that game tonight. Uh, Sal Niguez is among those to come into the side, as are Mason Mount, Christian Pulisic, and Kai Havertz in an all new front three. That game kicks off at half seven, as does the meeting of West Ham and Brighton. Shane Duffy on the bench for the visitors at the London Stadium. Wolves play Burnley and Southampton with Will Smallbone and Shane Long on their bench take on Leicester at St. Mary's. At 8.15, Jack Grealish returns to Aston Villa with Manchester City and Goodison Park hosts the 239th Merseyside Derby as Everton, without a win in their last seven games, play host to a free-scoring Liverpool side. The game is Rafa Benitez's 15th Derby, but his first as Everton boss, and he's been asked how they go about stopping Liverpool tonight. I think we have uh, to stay really focused. We have to go back to the principles that uh, we are defending or we were defending uh, as a unit, solid, compact together. And after, we try to play the best way possible on the ball. And then if we have to play counter-attack, do it. So I think uh, the main thing is to to go to the basic, to the principle that uh, we have to be strong in defence uh, physically and mentally. Well, The, uh, the Liverpool team just uh, dropped by the way, Joe. Shoot, uh, yeah. Pretty strong one too. Yeah, Alisson in goal, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Joel Matip, uh, Virgil van Dijk and Andy Robertson is their back four. In Fabin- or Fabinho, Jordan Henderson and Thiago Alcantara are their midfield. And that front three of Sadio Mane, Mo Salah and Diogo Jota. Yes, that counts as strong. Everton mm-hmm. on a terrible run of form. Five defeats in six, no win in seven. They're bottom of the table across those seven games when it comes to scoring goals. Dominic Cal- Calvert-Lewin's injury not helping them. And they have a really tough schedule coming up. After this game... It's Chelsea, it's Arsenal, it's a way to Crystal Palace. It's tricky all the way. There is a sense Rafa could find himself under some pressure if tonight was to go badly wrong. So Mark Lawrenson is going to join us this evening. And Joe, guess how many away. wins Rafa Benitez has against Liverpool since he left them? Oh, I've no idea. Zero. He's won none of the six games, so that's a 
a good sign for Everton ahead of this derby. Yeah. We'll also talk to Lauro briefly, I'm sure, about Ray Kennedy, former teammate for a time. Maybe everybody knew this. I hadn't realised that Ray Kennedy had been diagnosed with Parkinson's in his early 30s. Half his life he lived with Parkinson's, yeah. yeah. I remember there was, um, he was a guest, I think, of the BBC, I think it was ahead of the 92 semi-final that Liverpool played at, uh, at Highbury. They were playing Portsmouth that day. And I remember he was a guest and he was talking about his, his diagnosis then, which is uh, eight, seven, eight years on from his original diagnosis, 84. November 84 was when you first diagnosed. And uh, by all accounts, like his life from that point on was was fairly rough. Like his marriage fell apart and his personal circumstances weren't great. And it's it's kind of one of those sad stories. And you wonder how much, you know, the, the club and, and different people, like not just Liverpool, but Arsenal and, and others did their best. And, and if they did their best to look after him, because it's like he had a he had a pretty hard life, but an incredible yeah. career during his time. Like to, to like people forget he won the double with Arsenal in 71 like that yeah. and as a striker and Bob Paisley reverted him into a, into a midfielder and he was you know he lorded it over the left side of Liverpool's midfield until a certain uh, Orr Whelan uh, came over from England and, and unseated him mm. Three European Cups at Liverpool five league titles UEFA Cup in 76 and the Guardian obituary I'll mention this to Mark later on this hour so when he was formally diagnosed in late 1984 Kennedy finally able to account for some of the physical difficulties he had quietly noticed even back in his Arsenal days, where he sometimes had trouble doing up shirt buttons and occasionally suffered excess post-match fatigue, which is just extraordinary when you consider uh, the career. And as you mentioned, Richie, I hadn't fully appreciated either the extent to which life was difficult for him afterwards. He lost his pub licence in 87. You mentioned his uh, marriage uh, came to an end. And then The Guardian said, a long, dark period followed in which he struggled with the illness and the side effects of the medication became increasingly hard up and isolated. He was helped financially on occasion by the uh, PFA. He benefited from a testimonial match between Liverpool and Arsenal, which was staged for him in 1991, but in 1993 forced to sell his medals and his England caps to raise further money for care. So it uh, seems like it was a tough time for Ray Kennedy. So we'll talk to Mark Lawrence in this hour about Kennedy and about the Premier League games this evening. Now, St Pat's got the news they didn't want. Yeah, this hasn't gone down well at all with the, the Pats fans online this evening. St. Pats looks set to appoint Tim Clancy as their new head coach. Uh, FAI Cup winning boss Stephen O'Donnell appears destined for New uh, for Dundalk, New York, after Vinnie Perth was relieved of his duties last night. Pats have reportedly agreed a compensation package with Clancy's current club, Drada, worth in the region of €10,000. The former Kilmarnock player has been in charge of drugs since December of 2017. He led them to the first division title last year in a seventh place finish upon their top flight return. They beat the likes of Sligo, Bowes and Dundalk last season in the top flight with Clancy earning plenty of credits for the way they played football. Dan McDonnell will be along in the football show. We'll chat to him about that situation. Now, Kevin McMenamin, one of the greats. Absolutely, yeah. Another of the Dublin greats retiring from inter-county football today. He leaves the Dublin panel with eight All-Ireland medals, the first of which he helped secure directly with a goal against Kerry in the 2011 final. McManaman wasn't involved under Desi Farrell this year, but he did work with the Irish Olympic team in Tokyo. He says he's proud that his inter-county career went on as long as he did, still just 34 years of age. He says he's looking forward to the next chapter in his life. I mean, will his legacy was secure with the Kerry... 2011 final. He went on and won another seven All Irelands after that. There's an interesting piece, if somebody has the time to do it, to go back and check just how many games he impacted in a serious way as a substitute amongst all the money he started as well. But he was thrilling off the bench so many occasions. Yeah, look, he was a key part of why that team was so successful that, you know, when games were tight and Dublin needed to send in a player to do something slightly different in the forward line, being able to bring in a fresh Kevin McMenamin, he was just like a absolute uh, power force when he came on. And that goal in 2011 is a real sliding doors moment because many of the Dublin players who've been you know, part of the last decade and the success that they've had, they talk about how important it was to overcome Kerry in that decider, which ushered in the period of success uh, which they had. And, you know, the last year, it was intriguing to see how non-involved he was. But I wonder at what point did he decide that there was going to be a huge focus on the delayed Tokyo games and therefore his focus was going to be there. Because by all reports and from listening 
listening to many Dublin players, they talked about the influence that Kevin McMenamin not just had on the field uh, when he came on in games, but also as almost like an extra coach within the panel too. So I think he's a guy who's very likely to take up coaching. It's going to be intriguing to see what sport he ends up working in or whether he stays entirely on the psychological side of things as opposed to uh, maybe being more of a tracksuit coach. But I think he's a guy who seems really well set up to go into that line of work as well, Joe. Mm. Uh, Tis the season for Spotify wrapped, says a text. Oh, <laughs> I'm cu- curious what you three spent the year listening to from John. For what it's worth, I listened to an unusual amount of early 2000s R&B and hip hop. Shout out nice. to Timberland. I did, Timberland, one of the greatest composers of the modern age. Show. I did get a tweet from a uh, poor soul, frankly, who sent a screen grab to show he'd listened to over a thousand minutes of a uh, rugby podcast and off the ball. And that's um, worthy well, of well. An, an intervention, I would have thought, Will. That's pretty much every episode, I would say, that we went up from Monday Night Rugby and Wednesday Night Rugby over the last year. Like That's, that's, a, that's, an, awful that's, lot of, of that's an awful lot of who's going to replace Johnny Sexton conversation. It really is, yeah. The amount of times he probably has got <laughs> what age Johnny Sexton is going to be when he rocks up in Paris for the World Cup next time round is probably yeah. on repeat quite a few it's, times. I'll tell you how many days he's going to be into his 40th birthday that he can, yeah. There that's we go. incredible stuff. Uh, well, yeah, mine was all ambient stuff. My, my Spotify listening was purely stuff to get me asleep. So there's a lot of like uh, rain sounds, volume three, 10 hours of, oh, are of you street that? rain. Really? You like a bit of, of, I, uh, you need a bit of noise to sleep, do you? Why is that? Uh, I, I have done, re- I don't know if you've noticed, Joe, but it's been a pretty stressful pandemic ongoing for the last uh, 20 months or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you kind of uh, take what you can get, especially uh, as a, yeah, especially as an ex-drinker and whatever else, you know, so there's no um, there's no taking the edge off at night. So you're kind of like, ah, a bit of rain sounds, a bit of uh, forest ambience, that kind of thing. So my uh, Spotify wrapped is shamefully packed with um, a load of ambient music like Brian Eno and uh, yeah, stuff that basically would not make you not off. I had that last year, Joe, but not this year. I had the, in my definitely my top five was the five hours of, I think it was called uh, Sleeping in a Forest in a Tent or something like that. I think that's nice. what it was called. It's catchy. Yeah. So, it's catchy title. Yeah, that was, that was right up there for 2020. So obviously I must have found 2020 a lot more stressful than this year. I'm like, I'm genuinely starting to wonder if someone else has a password to my Spotify account because uh, the podcasts all fit in perfectly with what I listen to. But a lot of the music stuff was things that I genuinely haven't listened to because I went back through my like songs. And I'm like, wait a minute. So it's not that it was particularly embarrassing. It was more just like, I don't remember listening to these. So I don't know how they could be in the top five. Mm. Someone definitely is my password and I'm not using that as an excuse. No, it's fair enough. Richie, we have time for one more story. Take your pick, whatever is... Uh, uh, most, I'll, 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 I'll hit you with some breaking news, Joe, because the okay. WTA, in response to the continued disappearance of Peng Shui, have decided to suspend all tournaments in China and Hong Kong. Simon Stone, the WTA chairman and CEO says, I very much regret that it's come to this point. The tennis communities in China and Hong Kong are full of great people with whom we have worked for many years. They should be proud of their achievements, hospitality and success. However, unless China takes the steps we have asked for, we cannot put our players and staff at risk by holding events in China. China's leaders have left the WTA with no choice or remain hopeful that our pleas will be heard and the Chinese authorities will take these steps to legitimately address the issue. So I guess we started the news round with uh, moral fortitude or lack thereof and we finish it with uh, some definite moral fortitude on behalf of the WTA. Okay, interesting. Uh, lads, in fairness, Aron Thonish has just been on a cosy up trade mission with Saudi Arabia. These are the people that can actually make a difference, which I think is a very fair point into 5-3-106. We are out of time, Will. Thank you very much. Can I give you one shameless plug before I go, Joe? Please. Um, If listeners could check out the new OTB Club Championship uh, podcast, which started today, you can get it on the Off The Ball social channels or the GA channel for the OTB. Uh, We're talking to Brian McGrath, wing back on Lockmore Castellani's team. He was also involved with the footballers. They did a double in Tipperary the week just gone by. And Carol Kane looks forward to the start of the Ulster Championship where Kilku are looking to defend their title. So if you want to get on to next year's Spotify wraps, you can get 45 minutes of Club GA right now. Well, I will listen to that as I try and fall asleep this evening. Not that it'll put me to sleep. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) Nice. I'll be up all night. (laughs) Richie, thank you. Nice one. Your chance to win big. News Talk's Cash Machine. Well, we're on a roll of the wrong kind. No winner for a third day in a row in the News Talk Cash Machine. There was over 11,000 up for grabs today. The person we called didn't know the correct amount, which means cash rolls over again to tomorrow and will be topped up even more. So, to find out how much you can win. Be sure to tune in to News Talk Breakfast tomorrow morning from 7am. We have Mark Lawrence in next.